Hello, my name is Suzanne S. Stevens. I'm co-producer and host of Wisdom Exchange TV and the founder and president of the Ignite Excellence Group of Initiatives. One of our key initiatives is the Ignite Excellence Foundation, which our mission is leadership, advocacy, and education. Our mission is to inspire, invest, and develop women in emerging countries. The Wisdom Exchange is a resource to aid African women to learn, lead, and succeed in life, business, and community. We're in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, with our very special guest and leading lady, Hidnabush Nikusi, Acting Executive Director of the Ethiopian Center for Disability and Development, as well as the founder of Yatnabush Modern Academy. To further appreciate the accomplishments, we need to acknowledge the fact that our guest today is not only blind, but only 29 years old. And looking through your bio, you seem to be always getting involved. You're involved in student council and clubs, the university, you pursued two degrees. You started Addis Ababa University anti-AIDS movement, founded AA Female Students Association in 2006, and became, served as the first president, not to mention all the other stuff I just mentioned. What motivated you to get so involved so young? Well, getting involved is a way of proving your, who you are. I and mean, many people think that you are someone in a certain way, maybe looking at your color, looking at your age, looking at your physical ability, whatsoever. But there is somebody whom you want to prove that you are in life. So I want to prove that I am a person who is able to do everything. So I started involvement within my uh, early age in the schools, as you mentioned, within the clubs and then within the councils. And actually, I assumed higher leadership positions, like being president, vice president, founder in so many cases. So for me, getting involved in all these things is a way to prove myself, who I am, and who I want to be. So I learn from it as well as I teach others who I am. Now when you say you want to prove yourself, who are you proving yourself to? I am proving myself to the community, to my family, because as a baby, when you're born with a new family, you're someone who needs to be taken care of every time. You're someone who needs to be provided with things every time. So. Uh, I have to see the community and my family that I'm also a person who can contribute, not also consume, not only consume contributions from other people. So it's for the community, for my family, and for the world in general. Now, when you when you say that, um, is it as a person? Let's say you had sight. As a person, would you feel the same way that you would need to prove yourself to all those people, or is it because? that you don't have your sight, you feel more of a need to do that? Halfway yes, halfway no. It's not only because I'm blind, but also I'm a female, I'm living in a third world country, I'm, in a, live, I'm, in, I'm within a developing country. A number of factors that they, you can think about to, for people to draw who I am. Um, I mean, had I been a, per, per, a person with sight, then I would never be this way. I mean, you could go back to where I was born and where I was uh, grown up, uh, it's a place where you are susceptible to early marriage. So, I mean, had I, had, had, I, had I not been blind, then I would be married to someone in my early age, within 9 or 10, 11 years old. And then I would have some around 4 or 5 kids, and then I would have never been who I am. But what I am proving for others is that I can do things by my own. That's it. So, I mean, not as a blind, not as a young person, but as a person. I can do things by myself. Let's, I, I was going to ask you this later on, actually, but you, you brought it up. And I did read that you mentioned that you would have been married earlier if, if you weren't blind. What do you think you would have given up if you were married younger? Well, it's very difficult to imagine because I wouldn't have this level of consciousness. Right. So I don't think I would have the capacity to say no or to say, hey, this is the things I need to do and blah, blah. Um, I mean, I'm made up of nature and nurture. I'm made up of opportunities as well as uh, as well as instances. So I think I would have been made this way. I think somehow I would be someone aggressive because uh, I am a person who always sees that there are things which I didn't go through. There are things which I didn't achieve. So so maybe I I I, I could be demanding. But still, I wouldn't be the same person. I couldn't be demanding the same thing I'm demanding now. <laughs> Do you have some advice for young women particularly 
that see that they, they have to be married young to maybe validate who they are? I don't think mostly it's their choice to get married. It's mm -hmm. mostly the society's and the community's culture. Mm -hmm. But for anybody who can decide whether to get married or not to get married, I mean, if they have got the chance, I would say no, because you have more time to choose. And the more you're matured, the more you can get your right choice. With, with that, and, and I appreciate that it's also cultural, but sometimes you have to get married because that's what your, your society and family wants. What, what sort of advice could you give to mothers who, you know, want their children to get married young? Mothers are very anxious and um, in a hurry to see their kids have another kid or to see their kid being a responsible person in a home. But I would really appreciate that eating full today doesn't ensure the sustainable uh, you know, food security in your home. So I know that for them, they, they are really eager to see what's going to happen today. But what we work on today will definitely um, determine what will happen in the future. So if they want to have a bright future, let them uh, give the chance for their young kids to be able to choose whenever they are able to choose. So I know that they are anxious about today, but life is not only today, there's tomorrow. So we have to think about tomorrow. So whatever we do today should be in reflection to what should be happening, what should be achieved tomorrow in their life. So I think anybody should let the other person to be able to decide for himself or herself. You know, getting involved at a young age and what keeps you motivated and truly a trailblazer when it comes to disability. So what would be the one thing that continues that you continue to do new things and expand a world for people that are dis disabled? Two things. The first thing is recognition. I'm being recognized for every single work I'm doing. So I'm glad with that. Yeah. So the more I'm recognized, I feel that I have to be transferred to another level to, re to be recognized for another better thing. The second thing is um, challenge. I have challenges within all my ways when I go on with my life. Those challenges do keep me alert. So I have no time for sleeping. I have no time for frustration. Those challenges always ask me how I can solve them. So I think the first thing is recognition and the second thing is challenge. It's good to have challenges. That's how you're always alerted. That's how you're always motivated. And that's how you're always challenging yourself because the others are challenging you. I mean, it may be physical environment, it may be human beings, it may be financial situation, whatsoever challenges you, then you start to inquire yourself. Then am I, am, is this challenge going to stop me or am I stop this challenge? Mm -hmm. Then looking answer for that challenge makes me always alert and motivated. Well, and I, and I couldn't agree with you more, as my whole philosophy is push your edge to personal and professional potential, and that is coming up with challenges fears and things along those lines. Speaking of challenges, what are some of the biggest challenges in starting your own school? Because it's not easy, live alone in Ethiopia and many other African countries, blind women specifically as well as women with disabilities in general are assumed to be less caring for their children and many people think that it's very difficult for a blind woman to take care of her children, leave alone others children. So it was very difficult for many families to bring their kids to my school especially paying, thinking that I would take care of their kids. Really? So, yeah, it was very difficult. Mm -hmm. Then I had only 23 students, as I mentioned. And the fact that I had those 23 students was because of the fame I had in the media. So I, I was someone, you know, people appreciate me, people know me in the media. So they said, okay, then once we give our kids for her, then she will uh, shape them in a way that she's grown up. So they brought them. So I think gradually, I mean, it was a very good opportunity for me to have only 23 because it focused me, it helped me to focus on the quality other than the quantity. So everybody thought, okay, then she has the best quality. Mm -hmm. I could prove with those 23 kids. Had they been many, I mean, had they been more than that, then maybe I, I would fail with the quality. When the quantity is more than sometimes you would doubt about the quality. So, the, I mean, the 23 kids, the number 23 was a good opportunity for me because it was less of quantity and then it helped me to work on the quality. So the first thing is attitude. The second thing is physical premise. Still, I'm working in a rented premise. So you always deal with the landowners, with the landlord. The more business you're getting, the more they want to give you a hassle. You know? They want to say, okay, we want to sell this house. Okay, we'll say, okay, we want to rise up the price and so on and so forth. So I think those were the two major challenges. In your bio, it says that you believe you have one disability 
and the remaining 99 abilities to invest on. People tend to forget the 99 abilities that a person with a disability has and capitalize on the one disability which ultimately leads to charity. I want to take that, and I think that's very well said by the way, um, tell us your perspective on charity and what impact that actually has on society and individuals. Well, charity is always based on the goodwill of the giver. So the receiver has no say. All he or she has to do is just receive whatever is being given away. And uh, with that, there is an issue of sustainability, there is an issue of pride. Nobody's pride proud for being, you know, given away by someone. So I feel proud whenever I am given something, whenever I get something out of my work, because I think that I deserve that. But I could never think that I deserve a charity. And even though I think, I won't, because it's always on the goodwill of the giver. So, um, I mean, many people think that charity is giving away money for people. But for me, I mean, I'm not against being generous. I'm generous, but I don't give money. Because giving money is impoverishing someone, you know, getting him or her more poorer. So, in my thinking, I'm generous, but I only give opportunities. That's how I think people can be generous for others. But for charity, you're giving something which you don't want sometimes or which you want and which you think others need it and you are in a better position for others to give. So I think nobody's in a better position. All of us are in a good position that we can complement each other. So it brings about the inferior, superior kind of, you know, class level kind of division, which I don't like. You know, and interesting enough, I think that was one of the catalysts for Wisdom Exchange TV. It's our donation, but it's just with the intent to empower other women empowering other women. It's an opportunity rather than money. So I can definitely appreciate where you're coming from. Now, what, what advice can you give to anyone who relies on systems or others to, to extract them from dependency? It's like this, the story of the fish. If someone is catching the fish for you, then you will be hungry whenever that fish man is going to be absent. But if you learn from that person how to catch the fish, then you will be able to feed yourself forever. You know, and it's, it's hard though, like if you are hungry or if you are, um, have a, a, a physical disability that is an obvious physical disability, um, you know, is there any other advice that you can give to those people to take control of their own lives and not rely on charities? With an average challenge and high degree of challenge, there is a way out. For example, if I am a person with a very severe physical disability, so instead of waiting for others to give me money every day, I would look for something which I can do even sitting, mm -hmm. even staying at home. So I mean, I don't think there is no answer for any question. You have to be creative, you have to be innovative. Otherwise you're right, the normal, I mean, the regular thinking of people, if you're severely disabled or if, you, if you're severely poor, is that you have to receive money and things like that. No, what makes us disabled is the environment. So clear away the environment and enable me to do things. At least there is one thing, at least one thing that I could accomplish in life. So I have to make money out of it. Mm -hmm. Is the school itself focused on children in general or are those children physically disabled in one way or another? No, it's a mainstream school. It okay. has both children with disabilities as well as non-disabilities. The issue was there was a challenge between the private schools, among the private schools, to take in disabled kids. So mine was the first private school which take in both disabled and non-disabled kids at the same time. Okay. Because many private schools owners are afraid that if they take in disabled kids then the other parents won't be happy to teach their non-disabled kids with their disabled kids. But that's not the case in mine because they know that the owner is also disabled so I have no discrimination policy for anyone, not only disability but gender, HIV AIDS or any sort of social or economic background. Now, that being said, do people with children that don't have any of those limitations, let's say, uh, do they go to your school as well? Mm, some of them, yes, but uh, many of them are very supportive and even they assign their kids to help the other kids with some limitations. Mm -hmm. So they're very happy because their kids could contribute something to those yeah. uh, kids with limitations. Which is probably the best education a child can get, I think. Of course. <laughs> so, so how do you motivate your staff, as I would imagine it would be um, an emotional job in many cases. So what sort of tactics do you use or that to keep your staff motivated? And also, 
keep them engaged with the diversity of students that you actually draw to your school? My staff is very unique and they get, a tra they get trainings every, every month, kind of self-building trainings, capacity building trainings. Uh, we keep them, both me, my friends and my husband and so on and so forth, we keep them trainings on different issues and also we have our own release out sessions, like for example once in three months we go to films or theaters, something, but it's not just simply you don't get it because of being a staff, but because of performing better than you get a free film ticket, free theater. And some of them get a free message because I have got connections from different places, so I give them a number of different opportunities. But all of that is based on your performance. So the better you perform, I mean, salary is salary, you'll be paid whether you do or you don't do better. But there are other awards that I use to motivate people. So I have got friends from the massage industry, I've got friends from the film industry, I've got friends from the theater industry, so they give me different incentives, so I use those incentives for my staff. You know, that's wonderful. I actually have never heard of somebody using incentives for staff in the education system. And that's probably just because of where I come from. So that's really, it's, that's a real business yeah. uh, sort of philosophy is let's incent them and make sure that they, they keep performing. So what does systems do you have in place to ensure certain education standards are met? Uh, we always have our own supervisory board. So with that supervisory board comes in as a surprise visit to the school at the same time they give them different forms. Of course the government has its own quality control but uh, we have uh, mm -hmm. an, uh, as, an, uh, as owner I have my own supervisory board which is composed of different professions so they do come and then do a number of things. Is there any special things that you do in regards to keep your students engaged in the learning process? Yes of course um, and uh, in our school it's not um, we, we, we have to use the regular teaching system, like for example we have to use, if it's science, then we have to use the science textbook that the government has already issued. But what we try to do is we work on the, the sequence, like for example, if the lesson in science is about the water, like river and things like that, and if it's about water pollution, then we make our students learn about that in Amharic, and then we ask them to write poems in Amharic, we ask them to uh, write uh, poems in English about that, to write an essay about that, and we also take them out to visit that polluted water. And then, you know, they come kick back to the community saying that we live in this community and we learn in this community, but we've seen this polluted water and the, this, the polluted water has this and this disadvantage. So how can we do to change the pollution? How can we do the, to minimize the pollution? They can discuss with the governing officials. That way they can, you know, make decisions. So we uh, choose themes every month from different subjects. So we work on those themes uh, together I and mean, within all the subjects. So this makes them highly involved within the community. And also, you know, you don't expect a kind of, you know, eight or nine years old kid to come to you and say that this water is polluted, I'm very concerned about this and blah, blah, you know. You would feel really, yeah, you got ashamed and nervous about it. So people yeah. try to react on this. Like, for example, there was a road which was very narrow and then uh, on the on the side of the road people were selling products and then you know, my students were learning about traffic uh, movements so they went there and they said okay where is the pedestrian road and they said there's no pedestrian road because it's all occupied by illegal business persons so they went to the government and said no I'm a child and as I go out from my school to my home this road is completely crowded. I'm told by my teachers to use the pedestrian road, but uh, the pedestrian road is already occupied. So the government officials were really concerned and they said no business is here. So they were trying to give other alternative places for the business persons and release those kind of things. So it sounds like in the education system what you're, you're doing is you're saying, okay, we're going to read about it, we're going to write about it, and then we're going to experience it, and then we're going to do something about it. Exactly, yeah. What a brilliant philosophy. So making kids very involved in the community. Yes. And I guess some kids would be very passionate about it, and some may not. Very be. much. Most of them are very passionate about it, because okay. I mean, talking to a cabinet official, going there, it's something they could never aspire to do. But this is an assignment from your teacher, so you have to go and do it. And then they say, OK, I've met to our cabinet official. And you know, they're, I mean, it's very important. I mean, it's good to make kids think about their future. It's good to make uh, them think about their community, their future, their surrounding. I mean, the, I mean, many times kids learn about things in America, kids learn about things in Canada, and they would never love to live here. As soon as they finish grade 12, they say, how can I go to America, how can I go to Canada? 
But once we teach them about their community and they are directly involved in building their own community, then they feel a sense of belongingness to the community and they would always love to remain within that community. So. Excellent, excellent. Creating the future leaders of tomorrow, without yes. a doubt. Excellent. Now, what has been the most significant impact you feel you've made in your career so far? Um, I think changing people's thinking. People have their own thinking and it's not easy to change thinking and change is always something new, you know. So people are not, are not comfortable about changing things. But now I think the more they're used to my, uh, I mean, they, they trust you. So uh, building trust in, uh, and is also a very significant tool to change people's mind. Once people trust you, then it's easy for them to change things in accordance with your thinking. Mm -hmm. So particularly when you're referring to change within their thinking, what are you specifically referring to? A number of things, like change of thinking about disability, change of thinking about a young person taking responsibility, uh, change of thinking about a woman being able to pioneer new things. You know, in this country women are always told to be uh, someone who will follow that other men have already done, otherwise we're not taken as pioneers. I mean, we're not recognized as pioneers even though we are. So I think those kind of things have changed. Now, what do you attribute your success to? Um, if there was one thing, be it as part of your character or something that's happened to you, uh, what would that one thing be that has attributed all the success you've had so far? I think it's all my disability, as people call it, because all these other people can t do tell me that I can't do things because I'm disabled. So that's, uh, that, that's my secret success because I know that people will think that I won't do it because I'm disabled. So I try to do things and I want to prove that I'll do it because I'm disabled. So, <laughs> so really being, being called disabled is your catalyst for everything? Yeah. Okay. Today, what was, would be the most rewarding aspect of your career? Um, a number of people change economically ideologically. For example, the kids who are in my school were not the same, had not the same thinking and had, this, had not the same expressions. They are mighty words. At the same time with an ECDD, I'm working on changing people's mind on how to include persons with disabilities. So that change is a big, very good reward for me. I, I feel really honored when I see disabled persons being included in economic programs, in agricultural programs, in educational programs, wherever. So that's all my reward now. So what would you say would be the most challenging aspect of your career? I think working on men. I mean, all the thing I'm doing is related to human beings. It's not related to machines or things like that. So trying to change people's mind is very difficult because all those people are comfortable with something which they're familiar with. So whether it's something better, they don't want to change it because they think that I mean, living, there is even one saying in Amharic that we use, it's better, I mean, it's better to have a, a devil, which you are familiar with, instead of having an angel, which you are not familiar with. Mm -hmm. So that is, I mean, having that kind of saying, people are comfortable with what they think is their knowledge, what they think is their experience. So uh, it's very difficult to change what they have in mind. So yeah, absolutely. Without change, we don't evolve. So now, what would be the most significant decision you've made in your career? I think to study law because um, I studied law at my first degree. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted first to know is what rights do I, what privileges I'm entitled in life for, and what obligations do I have in life for. So I mostly focus on what are my obligations. Many people think that what has been done for me, and what are my rights, what what is something which I didn't think that I, I did I did deserve. But I always think what's my obligation? What didn't I fulfill out of my duty? That makes me always awake. Many people think that, what did my country do to me? What did my community do, do to me? What did my boss do to me? Things like that. But my always questioning is that, what did I do towards others? Mm -hmm. what, I mean, how did I do my duty? How did I do my obligation? Excellent. You know, has, there any, has there been any initiative that you have implemented that you felt didn't work or achieve the objective? And if you could tell us about that and then how you dealt with that. Well, a number of them, <laughs> because success is part of the failure, and I have started a number of good initiatives within the university as well as within the disability movement that didn't work. Still, I want the disability movement within Ethiopia to be 
so close but it didn't work so much because it did have its own remnants from the previous you know there are generational issues there are, you know everybody wants to remain a boss I want I'm, I'm working towards having young new blood to the disability movement it's not still happening and the reason is that the, there is a deep-rooted old age mentality of that young persons are not responsible to take, you know, big decision makings and things like that. So many people who are good leaders do not think that someone is able to do things better than they can do. So they are afraid they won't leave their places. It's not only within the disability movement, but within the whole leadership system I have, both in my country as well as in the disability movement. I don't think I have succeeded that much further within having new blood to leadership. Because people I mean, people who are already in place, in power, do not have the confidence for others to lead it. I know it's because of a good will that they think that they are the best to do. But they should know that they should uh, think have others to uh, do it. And I think uh, one of the characteristics of a good leader is having followers who can sustain things while he or she is not there in place. Yeah, very, very well said. What do you think needs to happen in order for those leaders to be developed? Oh, I think still it's a matter of confidence and there needs to be some legal instruments like for example which will uh, urge leaders um, not to lead uh, with, uh, beyond a certain time limit. But the problem is those leaders are the ones who can rewrite the constitutions and elongate their own lifetime. Well, there's political leaders and then there's leaders just in businesses. It sounds like what you were talking about is leaders in businesses and leaders in movements um, also need to step aside to let younger people come in. What kind, of, what kind of things could they do to encourage young people to get involved, do you think? I think schools should be active in this. I mean, for example, the practical method that we're using is that getting involved kids from the very beginning. Then I mean, how do you think that a kid who was in, in charge of uh, you know, uh, cleaning a polluted river within the community can also lead a shop within a business and that the, I mean, they can easily leave? And I think families should be also be proud enough to deliver, to have an early retirement and deliver it to their kids on time. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at your life, do you think you're conducting your purpose? Of course I am. <laughs> So let's, let's talk about that. So what kind of gifts do you think that you have, those 99 abilities that you have that have really made you the woman that you are, and, and the trailblazer, quite frankly, that you are? Hmm. Don't be modest. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's mostly just trial. And I do try, I, I do try everything. And I do try to take every opportunity, even opportunities which are not meant to me. Now, because as I mentioned, always I, I think about, did I fulfill my obligation? So, beyond things, I mean, I, I'm not happy. Some people are happy with something that they have achieved and they are okay with that. But for me, I think um, achievement is building on something. So, uh, my yesterday's achievement is only a story. Unless and otherwise it continues for today and tomorrow, then it will never be an achievement. It will remain being a story. Okay, so your potential is still remain to be seen. Exactly. Okay. So this is what I call our edginess segment. And what this refers to is something that you have to do that makes you uncomfortable. But you need to do it in order to continue to achieve the, your objective and your success that you achieved. I don't want to be labeled. Like for example, people label me as a person with a disability. And, um, they forget about my ability and then they, they focus on my disability. That's one thing. And people think that I'm special, but I'm not special. This is something which others can do. For example, if I succeed on something, people will think that, no, she succeeded because she's special. And they will never try, thinking that it's because I'm special that I've succeeded in that thing. So people think that I'm special, but I think that I'm part of the ordinary you know, system. So I, I, I advise others to continue with that because it's mostly a reason, an excuse for many people not to do the same as I do because they think that I'm special and I'm doing that because I'm special. Okay. And, and part of that, what we were talking about a little earlier too, before the interview, is you let people call you that as much as you don't like being called that, special or disabled. Exactly. Okay. Excellent. Now, while, while achieving your objective, how often do you feel uncomfortable? Oh, every day. <laughs> Because, I mean, within every minute, within every second, as long as you have some movement in life, there are 
good as well as bad things. So I feel uncomfortable. I think maybe half of my time I feel uncomfortable. Can you give us a specific uh, situation where you felt uncomfortable and how you handle that situation? Well, sometimes when people come to talk to me as a director and they see that I'm a young person as well as a woman, as well as disabled, then they feel like shortening their sessions. So what I would uh, let them do is just uh, uh, create another analysis so I give them more time to learn about what I did and how I, how I came there because mostly it matters who you are when you are mentioned to be a director some people need to have you a very giant body with a very kind of you know uh, old age and then they need a number of certificates and things like that to prove who you are so uh, how I accept them how I welcome them change things mostly now I'm, I'm just going to get some clarification on that you, know, you said how I welcome them and is that the energy which you use or is it also what you tell them about yourself so you gain credibility? I don't tell them about myself. Okay. I just let them learn about myself through the process. Okay. Which I think is really important advice. Yeah. Because often through the process of someone's learning about who you are, it's not like you need, you know who you are. You know what you've achieved. You don't have to prove anything to anybody, but let them discover who you are and you gain credibility. Exactly, and process. if you start telling about yourself, that's what people think would, uh, about, would think about you, is that all, all she knows is about herself, so she doesn't know anything about the other things. So they learn about me from other things which they are interested in, which I'm explaining. So you may have answered this question, but I am going to ask you it again. And, and if you can isolate what your one biggest obstacle is to get to this point, I think still it's attitude, the attitude of others about you, others, men's family, community, your friends, your surroundings and the world. People have different attitudes about me and the, I mean, there's something which they have already uh, determined for me to be. So I'm against that. So how you deal with that is just doing things. I do things and I prove that it should, I mean, their thinking is not the right thing. Rather than trying to convince them, they'll, they'll see. Not really, yeah. not really. That's waste of time and waste of words. Yeah, absolutely. What does success mean to you? Success is getting yourself. I mean, being introduced to yourself very well, very, very being linked to yourself very well. I listen to myself, I discuss with myself, I always examine myself, I test myself. So for me, for someone, success is getting yourself properly. Understanding yourself. And how would you define leadership? Leadership for me is um, creating a system at which uh, a number of others can flow and come in. So it's working on the system which others can pass through, which others can sustain. As a leader, what do you find are the three most powerful pieces of advice you can give to someone trying to lead a project, a team, or initiative? Well, the first thing is, don't tell, people, don't tell other people how to do things, but do and let them learn from that. The second thing is, being a leader, you have to be a risk taker. So make sure that you are taking the enough risk, I mean, the, the, you know, the maximum risk that others can learn from you. The third thing is that make sure that you have other successors who will maintain the change that you have already acquired within the process, the leadership process. Excellent leadership lessons. <laughs> Thank you. And very succinct, too. Now, is there one thing you would do differently in pursuit of your success? And if there was, what would it be? I would have liked if I had done the success of mine in a broader map than I'm doing. Like, for example, I'm doing it with children. I'm doing it with the disability movement. It's all kind of, you know, closed kind of target group. Had I done it with the world, I think had I done it in a very broader, like, for example, had I been a very famous media person internationally or something which I could address a better number of population than I did then it would have been a success. Otherwise it would take me it's gonna be it's gonna take me time to like it all the world. Well you're twenty nine, you have a little bit of time. Twenty nine <laughs> is too much <laughs> So what is next for you? Next for me is um, I think coming to well, duplicating my uh, successes to uh, other areas like for example and growing growing a building on already acquired successes and for example I have started a school here then I would like other private school owners also to start the same taking disability kids in 
and well, building on already existing efforts. I've already worked. Wonderful. So, given the chance, what would you love to do that you haven't done yet? And and this, the world's your oyster here. It doesn't have to be with your career. It could be anything. Oh. <laughs> it's too much that I haven't done. So, I would love to do a number of things. But uh, very recently, I want to be a mother, a very proud mother, because I've been uh, mentioned with the other processes of life. But I was just married nine months ago, so I would congratulations. Love to be. <laughs> I would love to be a very uh, nice mother, so that's one. And I want to promote myself into being an international leader. Most of my efforts were highly determined within Ethiopia and sometimes in Africa. Now I want to see myself, I want to spread my words to the, all the world and I want to show the world, the international people, the same thing I have seen for my community. If you had a daughter 10 years old today, uh, what words of wisdom would you give to her? Um, loud, proud, and passionate. I want my key to be loud, as loud as possible, so that people can hear what she thinks, what she speaks. And I want to be, I want her to be proud of her, just expressing herself as someone who is very capable, efficient, and unique. Someone who has a number of things to contribute to this world. Passionate, always moving forward. What do you wish someone told you when you were that age? Oh, I would have been a completely different person. I think I would have been maybe five or six times much achiever than I am today. So if you heard those words, or is there, are those the words you wish you had heard when you were 10? Of course. Yeah, okay. If you two were to look back on anything, is there anything that you would have changed? I think I would have changed my learning setting. I have already attended my first primary schools in a special school, only for the blind. So I would have loved, had I learned in a mainstream school, I would have the opportunity, and had I stayed with my family, with my community, then I would have uh, had the chance to grab more from my community. I mean, special school setting is more of artificial. All you get is something that they think that you deserve it. So, had I got the chance to change things going back, then I would have loved to be educated in a mainstream school. You didn't say I would have changed being blind. I think and, that's. And I think that's. And no, but I think that that's actually extremely important that you didn't. Actually, say that. that's the poisonous point. I would say. I mean, I Good. would never say this because I've told you the secret of my uh, success is being blind. Had I not been blind, and had I, I mean, my, my grandparents would never let me come to the urban areas. So had I, had I not come to the urban areas, I would not have been educated, and I would not have been the person today. So. Blindness is something which I had already, I, I, I would never say that I would change it because that blindness already is the secret, the secret for my sex, as I told you, the, ch the challenge is my opportunity. But I think that is, that the challenge is your opportunity, which I really think is a very important message that needs emphasizing, so yeah. that, is, that is wonderful. You know, your words of wisdom to African women in general. I think I would repeat what I said for my 10 uh, years old daughter because uh, I feel that African women are my sisters, mothers, and some of them my daughters. So I think for African women what we lack to do is, we have to be loud, proud, and passionate. We have already very impressive things that we have done, and we are quite indispensable in human life in Africa. A number of successes within African history are achieved because of our presence. So I think we have to be loud, because we are not loud, Others who are loud have already taken our credit. Because we're not proud, others who are proud have already taken our credit. Because we're not passionate, others who are already passionate have already taken our passions out of our hearts. So I think we need to be loud, proud, passionate. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today. And my name is Suzanne S. Stevens, and I co-produce Wisdom Exchange TV with my husband, Michael K. Ginrich. We're traveling all over Africa and just arrived in Ethiopia a couple days ago. And this is our first interview in Ethiopia, so thank you very much for being our first. We are traveling, as I said, all over Africa, interviewing women like the woman we just interviewed today. And if you're not blown away right now, I have shivers from her messages because they're powerful and they're real and they're authentically her. And that's what's really important. And we're looking for women to interview. So if you know women like this, that we can interview leaders in politics, philanthropy, education, or business, please email us at info at wisdomexchangetv.com. And we'll look into them and see if they fit the criteria of leadership of women leaders all over Africa. 
Also, please subscribe to Wisdom Exchange TV. Right now we have a special offer on that if you subscribe, you'll also receive a white paper that I've done on presenting persuasively to influence anybody from the boardroom for fundraising. These will give you techniques that I've trained in um, five continents on how to influence people. So you'll get that, that free. And do tell your friends as well. Lastly, if you know or work for an organization that would like to sponsor Africa Business Women Connected Summit that is drawing top business leaders all over Africa, please also inf uh, send us an email at info at Wisdom Exchange TV. I'd appreciate that. And I want to leave with uh, my final words of wisdom, and I think they will complement what we've heard today. We all have some sort of disability, but it's what we do with our abilities that makes us live and a fulfilled and impactful life. And we saw a lot of abilities today. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Suzanne F. Stevens.